you who believe Give charity For the pleasure of Allah The pleasure of Allah Oh you who believe Read the Quran Every night of Ramadan Night of Ramadan Welcome O Ramadan It is Ramadan It is Ramadan Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing the topic Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islah, part three. Dr. Zakir, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, Dr. Zakir, we've come to the next episode regarding the topic self-improvement and Islah in the month of Ramadan. And this is such a wonderfully large topic. So, Dr. Zakir, in the last two episodes, of course, we covered the 70 major sins and we were urging them in this month of Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam, to recognize those mistakes and change them. Inshallah. Now, inshallah, let's hope that I've taken some note of that and the viewers have as well. Um, what I'd like to concentrate on now during this episode is the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how we can best implement these wonderful guidelines beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given us in this month of self-improvement and Islam. So first of all, could you explain to us what is a Sunnah, what does it mean and how many types of Sunnah are there? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbi ajmeen amma baad a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim bismillahi r-rahman r-rahim rabbi shahli sadri wa yisalli amri wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafqa kawli the word sunnah literally means the way or the custom and the sunnah of the prophet means the way of the prophet or the prophet's tradition the word sunnah it indicates and means the things the deeds and the approval of the Prophet in the span of 23 years during his prophethood. It means what the Prophet said, what the Prophet did, and what the Prophet approved in the span of 23 years during his prophethood. And the Sunnah of the Prophet can be divided into three types. The first is Sunnah Kali, that means the sayings of the Prophet. The second is Sunnah Faili. That means the actions of the Prophet. And the third is sunnat e takriri which means the approval of the Prophet. So basically, these three types of sunnah are there in three different categories. Okay, that um, seems very straightforward. But could you perhaps, uh, for the benefit of the viewers and myself, give cite some examples of each of the different categories you've mentioned? The example of the first type of sunnah, that's sunnah al-Kali, the sayings of the Prophet. For example, Muhammad said in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, hadith number 631, the Prophet said, pray as you see me praying. So this is a commandment of the Prophet. It's a saying of the Prophet. And it is the duty of a Muslim that we should follow it. The example of the second type of sunnah, sunnah al-Fayli, that is the deeds of the Prophet is mentioned in, for example, Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, Book of Adan, hadith number 736. Here it says that the Sahaba who narrates, whenever I saw the Prophet of a Salah, 
he used to raise his hand up to the shoulders. And then when he said the takbir, he again did the same action, raised the hand up to the shoulders and then he bowed down. When he came up, he said, Samu Allah Ali bin Hamida, that Allah hears those who praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again he did the same action, that is, raised his hands up to the shoulders. But he did not do the action raising the hands up to the shoulders between the two prostrations when he said the takbir. So this is the action of the Prophet. A sahaba sees the action and narrates it. This becomes sunnat faili The third type of sunnat is the sunnat takriri that is the approval of the Prophet. And the example is given in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number one, in the book of Salah, hadith number 1262 where once the Prophet, he prays the Fajr Salah, he leads the Fajr Salah in the congregation and after the Salah is over, he sees a man, after Salah, he gets up and he offers two rakat Salah. So the Prophet says, that the Fajr Salah is only of two rakat, indicating why did you offer two rakat again? So he said that I did not offer the two Sunnat Salah before Fajr, Farz. That's the reason I'm offering it now. And the Prophet kept silent. Now, because the Prophet was silent, it gives the indication that he approved it. Because if something is wrong, it's the duty of the Prophet to correct it. So because he kept silent, it gives an approval. So this comes in the third category of Sunnah, that Sunnah Takriri, approval of the Prophet. In these three types of Sunnah, if all the Hadiths are authentic, all the Hadiths are Sahih, the sunnah that carries the maximum weight is sunnat e kali that is the saying of the Prophet. Because that is the general ruling. Because if a Prophet says something or if the Prophet commands something, it means he has done it intentionally and with a purpose that is the highest degree amongst the three. The next is sunnat e faili that is the action of the Prophet. So what the Prophet did, maybe a sahaba saw it and narrates it. But there can be occasions where a prophet did certain things out of necessity, which may not be the normal norm. Therefore, the action of the prophet carries less weight than the saying of the prophet. Saying is with consciousness and that is the general ruling. And if there is a difference between the saying and the action of the prophet, the saying of the prophet carries more weight. Because maybe the action was done out of some reason or out of some purpose, which the person who is seeing it he may not be aware of it. And we'll have such examples. I'll give some examples in future inshallah in this episode. And the third amongst the three is the sunnat e takriri approval of the Prophet. That means he kept silent, that means it is approved, it is permissible. Dr. Zakir, what is the importance and the authority of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? As far as the Sunnah is concerned, it is the second unavoidable source of Islam. If you have to understand Islam, number one source is the Quran and the second is the Sunnah of the Prophet. To understand the full Islam, you cannot understand without these two sources. Both are important, the Quran as well as authentic Hadith, the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet. And as far as the importance of Sunnah is concerned, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 59, Atullah wa Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And those charged with authority among you. But if you differ among yourselves, refer it back to Allah and His Rasul if you believe in Allah and the last day. This is the best and the most suitable for the final determination. Here the word used in the Quran is Atiyu, which means to obey. And it's used for Atullah. Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So the obey word is used for Allah and the Messenger, but it's not used for those charged with authority among you. That means the undisputed obeying is only for Allah and His Rasul. And further goes on and saying that if those among you, those charged with authority, if you differ among yourselves, refer it back to Allah and His Rasul. So Allah and His Rasul are the final authority. It doesn't say refer it back to those charged with authority. 
because we know that many a time the scholars they differ among themselves so if they differ if any scholar differs to go back to allah and rasul and the scholar who is in line with allah and rasul you have to follow him so this is the importance of the sunnah and further there are two separate things it says atullah wa atur rasul obey allah and obey the messenger so obey allah means follow the quran and obey the messenger means follow the sunnah of the messenger that is the authentic hadith furthermore it says that both these two sources are different quran is different and the sunnah authentic hadith are different and further if we analyze the word wa is used between them indicating that you have to follow both it doesn't say summa atullah summa ti rasul that then you follow the rasul you have to follow both of them simultaneously then only will you understand islam in the right perspective and here the word that is used here that it is obey allah and the messenger both are equally important when it says refer back to allah and the rasul that means i have referred back to allah and the rasul not only to allah or not only to the rasul both are important for you to understand the true sharia and the last point to be noted is that the starting of the quranic verses ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu o you who believe atullah wa atur rasul that means obeying allah and obeying the messenger is for all the believers it's not only for the companions or for some of the believers it's for all the believers further it's mentioned in surah jin chapter number 72 verse number 23 it says that if you disobey allah and his rasul then your place will be in the hell fire to dwell therein forever that means if you disobey allah and his messenger your place will be in hell fire you will not enter paradise further it's mentioned that if you don't obey allah and his messenger your deeds will be in vain allah says in surah muhammad chapter number 47 verse number 33 obey allah and obey the messenger and let not your deeds go in vain further as far as the authority of the sunnah is concerned and the importance is concerned obeying the messenger is obeying allah subhanahu wa taala allah says in surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 80 that if you obey the messenger you obey allah subhanahu wa taala and if you turn away we have not sent the messenger to look after your affairs especially your evil deeds and further it's mentioned in the hadith of sahih muslim volume number 3 hadith number 4518 the beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if you obey me you obey allah if you disobey me you do sabe allah so obeying the messenger is same as obeying allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and furthermore allah says in the quran in surah najm chapter number 53 verse number 3 and 4 that the messenger does not speak out of himself it is nothing more than an inspiration sent down to him and the beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 9 hadith number 7280 the beloved prophet said that there are among the believers who will enter paradise and some will refuse to enter paradise so the sahaba asked who would refuse to enter paradise so the prophet said those who obey me they enter the paradise those who disobey me they refuse to enter it and finally the quran says that if you obey the messenger allah will love you Allah says in Surah Al-Imran chapter number 3 verse number 31 Allah says to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam say tell them if you love Allah follow me that is follow the messenger and Allah will love you and he will forgive your sins so following the messenger is loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is the importance of the sunnah in Islam following on from your answer um could it be said that a person who intentionally neglects the sunnah would that person be punished in the hereafter before i reply to your question i would like to clarify certain points as far as the actions and deeds of any muslim is concerned they are broadly divided into two categories one is halal and the other is haram halal is the permissible category haram is the forbidden prohibited category furthermore the halal category is further divided into four subcategories 
the first is the fard which is obligatory which is compulsory second is the mustahab the things which are encouraged in islam third is the mubah the things which are optional in islam the fourth is the makruh the things which are discouraged in islam or detestable so in all there are five categories number 1 is fard which is obligatory and compulsory number 2 is the mustahab things which are encouraged the third is the mubah things which are optional fourth is makruh things which are discouraged or detestable in islam and fifth is haram things which are forbidden and prohibited now if a person does an act of fard and compulsory act he gets a reward that is he gets positive points if a person does not do a fard thing he gets a punishment he gets negative points as far as the second category is concerned that is mustahab if a person does a mustahab act he gets a reward he gets a positive point but a person who does not do a mustahab act he gets no punishment he gets no negative points the third category that is mubah optional whether a person does the mubah optional act or not or does not do an optional act he gets no positive no negative points he gets no reward he gets no punishment it's absolutely neutral it's optional the fourth category is the makruh the discouraged or detestable if a person abstains from things which are makruh he gets a positive point he gets a reward and if a person does the makruh thing he gets no punishment he gets no negative point as far as the last fifth category is concerned that is haram that is prohibited if a person abstains from doing the haram thing then he gets a positive point he gets a reward if he does the haram act he gets a punishment he gets a negative points so these are in brief as far as the five categories are concerned now coming to the question of sunnah sunnah are of two types one is the lughvi sunnah that is the literal meaning of sunnah that is the sayings the actions and the approval of the prophet so as far as the lughvi that is the literal meaning of sunnah is concerned it can fall in the first four categories it can either be a sunnah which is fard a sunnah which is mustahab a sunnah which can be mubah or a sunnah which is makruh so the lughvi sunnah the literal sunnah can fall under any four categories for example sunna following in the fard category is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed the fajr salah he prayed the zuhur salah he prayed all the five prescribed salah that way the actions of the prophet and also saying of the prophet but it falls in the fard category the example of the mustahab sunna is the prophet he prayed the two rakat sunna before the fajr salah it's not a farz to pray two rakat sunna before fajr but it is mustahab it is encouraged this is the second category the third category of muba will be muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had long hair it was optional you know so anyone who has long hair it's optional it is permissible the example of the fourth category makru people think that can the prophet do something which is makru and they will be shocked what is akid speaking prophet sunnah of the prophet is makru i will give an example the hadith is saying that prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that do not drink while standing so drinking and standing is makruh fine right? so the right mustahab is to sit and drink but the hadith is also saying that the prophet he stood and he drank water maybe there was a reason there was a requirement so standing and drinking is makruh sitting and drinking is mustahab standing and drinking is discouraged sitting and drinking is encouraged so there are times in case of necessity when the requirement is there the prophet did do sometimes things which are makru so this will fall under the category of sunna which is makru in the lughvi sense not in the fiqh sense i'll come to it later on otherwise people will say what is zakir saying that that is sunna means doing makru no it is not lughvi as yes, it can be because the prophet did it he stood and drank water but normally most of the times almost all the times he sat and he drank so there are times of necessity but since a person does makru he will get no negative points no punishment and the prophet didn't get punishment but neither will he get any reward 
So this was in brief talking about the Lugvi Sunna, that is the literal definition of Sunna. It can fall under any four categories, Fard, Mustab, Mubah or Makru. Now coming to the second category of Sunna, that is the Fiki Sunna, which we normally, when we talk about Sunna, it's taken for granted it is the Fiki Sunna, that is Sunna in Fiqh and Asul, you know, when we talk about Sunna. So this basically is the second category of Mustahab. When we say that you pray the two rakat sunnah before Fajr, it is sunnah of the Prophet. It is sunnah of the Prophet to sit and drink water. When they say this sunnah, it is talking about the sunnah of fiqh. It indicates the word mustahab. So normally in day-to-day -day life when we Muslims say it is sunnah to do this and sunnah to do that, most of the times, almost all, when they use the word it is sunnah of the Prophet to sit and drink, it is sunnah of the Prophet to pray two rakat sunnah before the Fajr Salah. It is sunnah of the Prophet to read two rakat Tahatul Masjid when we enter the mosque. All these mainly come into the category of mustahab. So the fiqh sunnah is mustahab, things which are encouraged. And in all these five categories of fard, mustahab, mubah, makru, and in haram, there are subcategories. Like as we discussed last time, sins, major sins, minor sins. So in haram, things, there are harams which are major, haram which are minor. Same thing, makru, which are less makru, some are more makru. Muba, fine, the Prophet kept long hair, it's muba, optional. But if someone does that optional thing, for the love of the Prophet, it will get sawab. Though it's optional, no punishment, no reward. But if you're doing for the love of the Prophet, then for that you'll get. Again, so there's optional things which the Prophet did, that carry more weight than optional things which the Prophet did not do. Furthermore, in mustahab, there is sunnate moqeda, sunnate gair moqeda. Sunnate moqeda means a more important sunnah. The two sunnah before the Fajr Salah is sunnate moqeda. It's a more important sunnah than the other sunnah. So sunnate moqeda, sunnate gair moqeda. Same thing in the faraiz, in the first thing. There are some which are more important, some which are less important. For example, the five pillars of Islam. Number one is Tawheed, which is the Fard, offering Salah, fasting the month of Ramadan, doing Hajj if you can do, giving Zakat. All these are more important Farais. And abstaining from major sin, this itself, all we have discussed 70, come in major Farais. Then there will be less Farais. So in all these categories, there are subcategories. But coming to a basic question, that will we be punished? if we intentionally do not do the sunnah of the Prophet. Now this sunnah you're talking about, I assume, it is the fiqh sunnah. If it's the lugvi sunnah, I've already given the answer, the first four categories. Fiqh sunnah means it falls in the category of mustahab, which I already discussed earlier, that if you do a mustahab act, that is the fiqh sunnah, you will get reward for it, you'll get blessings for it. If it's sunnah moqeda, then more blessings. As compared to sunnah gair moqeda, that also will get blessings, but less. But if a person does not do it intentionally or unintentionally, he will not be punished for that. But that does not mean because we will not get punishment for not doing the sunnah, we should abstain from doing it. Because we human beings, we make so many mistakes. We do so many faults. We involved in so many sins. These sunnah, when we do, we get additional points. We get rewards. This will help us in fulfilling the lacuna which is there in other faults. What the other faults we do, it helps in covering up our faults, some of our sins. So therefore, a Muslim should do as much as sunnah as possible. Just because he will not get a punishment, that doesn't mean that he should not do it. In fact, he should try and do as much as sunnah, look with sunnah, mustab acts, so that it will help him to cover up the other faults which human beings do. And it will help him to go to Jannah. Well, subhanallah, the system that you've described is so equitable that uh, if one makes a mistake in one area that you can make up for it in, an, in another area Alham, of your life. Alhamdulillah, Allah is the most merciful. That's the reason it gives us chance, more and more opportunities to come on the straight path and to enter Jannah. Subhanallah. Dr. Zakia, is keeping a beard a fad or a sunnah and what is the ruling for a person who shaves his beard? As far as keeping a beard, whether it's a fard or a sunnah, and I understand that when we use the word sunnah in future, it will be the fiqh sunnah or the word mustahab. 
Therefore, I prefer using the word mustab for sunnah so that there's no two difference of understanding. So as far as keeping a beard, whether it is a fard or a mustahab or sunnah, most of the scholars, majority, almost all, they say that keeping a beard is fard for all the Muslim men. There is no verse in the Quran which says whether keeping a beard is fard or not, except there's one verse which speaks about the beard in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 94, where Aaron, peace be upon him, Harun alayhi salam, he tells to his brother Musa alayhi salam, that, O oh son of my mother, do not hold me by my beard or by the hair on my head, indicating that Harun alayhi salam, he had a beard. And when we read the seerah of the Prophet, and all, we come to know that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beard. Alhamdulillah. And all the righteous people and all the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, righteous people, the sahabas, we realize that they had the beard. The ruling as far as it is fard is based on the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of Sayyid Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of Dress, hadith number 5892, Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that the Prophet said, do the opposite of what the mushrikeens do, what the pagans do. Keep the beard and trim your moustaches short. Now based on these hadith and several Sahih hadith mentioned in Sahih Muslim and other hadith, the scholars said that because it's a commandment of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called commandment, Therefore, it becomes fard on every Muslim to keep a beard. Most of the scholars, alhamdulillah, all the scholars, including the four aima, the four aimas, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ibn Ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on them all. All of them said that keeping a beard is fard. So according to all four schools of thought, keeping a beard is fard. Even according to the scholars, the shaykhs of Salafi Salin, the Salafi scholars, all of them said that keeping a beard is fard. There is no different opinion. And according to Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, he says that according to the Quran and according to the Sunnah and the Ijma of the scholars, keeping a beard is fard and anyone who shaves off the beard, it is haram, it is prohibited. And even the scholars of the four schools of thought, Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, all of them say that shaving the beard is haram, all the scholars. There are a few scholars, very hardly any amongst the old scholars who have said that keeping a beard is mustahab and shaving is makro. If keeping a beard is mustahab, shaving becomes makro. Very few amongst the old scholars. But recently, among the new scholars, you have a little bit more numbers who say that it's not far that it is mustahab, like Sheikh Abu Zahra, Sheikh Jadu al-Haq, who is the ex-vice chancellor of Al-Azhar University, Sheikh Yusuf al-Kardawi, few that have come recently and especially if you go to North America, if you see the fatwas of the North American Fiqh Council, the ulmas of this Fiqh Council, many of them have said that keeping a beard is not fard, that is mustahab, you'll get reward but it's not fard and if you shave it, it's not haram, it's makro. But as a whole, the scholars of the past, almost all, there's a consensus that keeping a beard is fard and shaving it off is haram. Okay. Dr. Zakir, but what about the required lengths of the beard? Because there are many people with different lengths and, and it's rather confusing when you look outside and you think, oh, what should I be doing? What did the Prophet Muhammad uh, do? As far as the length of the beard is concerned, the scholars are divided, they have different opinions. And as for what is the length of the beard, there are two opinions. One group of scholars say that because the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, one number seven, book of dress, hadith number 5892 says, the Prophet said, do the opposite of what the pagans do. Keep the beard and trim your moustaches. So because the commandment is keep the beard, that means they say that it should be kept. That's it. And the second hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, book of death, hadith number 5893 says that cut your moustaches short and grow the beard. So the first group of scholars say, grow the beard means keep on growing. You should not touch it. Keep the beard means let it be. Therefore, you should not at all, neither trim the beard, nothing at all, you should let it grow as much as possible. This is their view. But if you read, there is not a single say hadith which speaks about the length of the beard of the Prophet. Not a single say hadith. There's not a single say hadith. But according to Sheikh Utaymi, he says that we understand when the hadith says that keep the beard or grow the beard, it means you should leave it, you should not touch it and let the length be as much as possible. 
and if someone shaves it as a haram and someone trims it to the size of a fist, that is the other view, then it is makru. So this one group of scholars said, let it grow as much as possible. The other group of scholars, what they say, that the length of the beard should be one fist. As I mentioned earlier, there is no Sahih Hadith which speaks about the length of the beard of the Prophet. There's a Hadith which is a Zaif Hadith or a Maudu Hadith. We say that the beard of the Prophet, it touched the chest. But that's a Zaif or a Maudu Hadith according to Shaykh Nasruddin al-Albani. There's a Hadith mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 4, Hadith number 5789, where Jabir bin Samura, he says, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet had a thick beard. So there are many Sahih Hadith which say the Prophet had a thick beard, but doesn't mention the length of the beard. But this group of scholars, they say, that since the length of the beard is not mentioned, what we have to do is we have to look at how the Sahabas kept the beard. The length is not mentioned, so we have to look at the Sahabas, because the Prophet said, if you don't find in my example, then look at the people around me in this generation, at the companions, Sahabas. And when we look at the Sahabas, we find several authentic hadith, more than 10 Sahih hadith, which say that the Sahaba, they kept their beard at the length of one fist. And whatever was below the one fist, they trimmed the beard. Including Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, all these Sahabas which are very close to the Prophet, they trimmed their beard. Even those Sahaba who narrated the same hadith, Ibn Umar, May Allah be pleased with him, hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, book of death, hadith number 5892. Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, who narrated the hadith, that the Prophet said, that do opposite of what the pagans do. Keep the beard and trim your moustaches. Immediately after that, the hadith continues and says, that whenever Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, used to go for Umrah and Hajj. After Umrah and Hajj, he used to catch the beard with his fist, and whatever was below the fist, he used to cut it. So imagine those Sahabas who narrated the Hadith, and all these Sahabas, Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with them all, they were staunch followers of the Sunnah of the Prophet. And they narrated the Hadith. When they narrated the Hadith of trimming the moustache and keeping the beard, growing the beard, they understood the way the Prophet wanted. So why did they trim the beard? If the view of the first group of scholars, they write that keep on growing. Growing means how to grow? The way the Prophet grew. And if there's no Hadith indicating his sayings or actions, then you look at the way the Sahabas did. That is the way how you analyze the Hadith. That is the reason Sheikh Nasr al-Albani, he says that the right size of the beard should be the size of a fist. And he says, for example, that when we analyze the Hadith, if it's present in the sayings, that is the best of the Prophet. If it's not, you look in the actions. If not in the actions, approval. If it's not there, you look in the lifestyle of the Sahaba. What did they say? What did they do? So we agree that what the Sahabas did was they followed the Prophet. And you don't find a single Hadith, neither of the Prophet or neither of any of the Sahabas, we say that they did not trim the beard. There are more than 10 Hadith we say that the Sahabas, they trimmed the beard below the fist. If there was even a single Hadith which says that this Sahaba did not trim the beard at all, then it can be possible that both are right. Because there's not a single hadith on the other side saying that the Sahaba never trimmed the beard, but there are no less than 10 Sai hadith which say that the Sahaba is below the fist, they trim the beard. According to Sheikh Nasr al-Albani, it is fard to trim the beard below the fist. It is fard. And anyone who keeps a beard more than the fist length, it is makru according to him. Makru. Detestable. So this is a strong fatwa. In Bashir Nasr al-Albani, he is very staunch. And I personally agree with his view because there is evidence in the lifestyle of the Sahaba. And he further says in his book, and he writes that why it should be the length of one fist. He said, besides the Sahabas, many examples we find who kept one fist and cut below one fist their beard. He gives the examples of many Salafis Salihin who had the beard the size of a fist and they trimmed the beard below the fist. Like, for example, an -Nakhi. We have examples of Imam Malik, Imam Ibn Ibn Hanbal, all these great self Salihin, they trimmed the beard below the fist. They quit it like that and they trimmed it below the fist. So this is the 
view of the second group of scholars, and I agree more with the group of scholars, including Sheikh Nasrud Albani, that the right size is the size of the fist, and the rest, Allah alam. Jazakallah khair for the answer. Dr. Zakir, is it a sunnah to wear the head covering, wear the cap? Um, because we do see a number of people, particularly those people who have returned from Gulf countries and such like, Hajj, etc., that deliberately remove their cap um, whilst they're praying. Is there any basis for this at all? As far as the first part of the question is concerned, that is it a sunnah? Is it mustab to cover one's head? There are various hadith which say that Prophet Muhammad his head was always covered, whether with a cap, with a turban, whether with a helmet, and even the head of the sahabas were covered. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number two, in the book of Hajj, hadith number 3148. It says that when Muhammad addressed the people on the day of the victory of Makkah, he was wearing a black turban. So there are many hadith saying that Muhammad covered the head. Further, according to a hadith which is narrated by Ibn Umar, it says that Muhammad wore a white cap. It's narrated by Ibn Umar. And according to Tabarani, he has rated this as Hassan hadith. It's one of the categories of Sai, Hassan. And according to Imam Suyuti, it says it is a highly authentic hadith. He says in his book, Sirajul Bini, volume number four, page number 112, where he says that this is a highly authentic hadith that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wearing a white cap. The Arabic word is Kufi for a cap. In India, we say Topi. It is authentic. And there are other hadith saying that the Sahaba also covered the head. A similar hadith is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, in the Book of Dress. Hadith number 5802 says that Anas bin Malik, may life be with him, he covered his head. He wore a cap. So based on all these hadith, almost all, it's a unanimous agreement among the scholars, the ijma of the scholars, that covering the head is mustahab. It is the sunnah of the Prophet. It is mustahab, it's encouraged. All, all the four schools of thought, the Hanafi, the Shafi, the Malaki, the Hanbali, all four schools of thought and all the four ahimmas, they agree that covering the head is mustab. And when you pray, while praying also it's mustab to cover the head. It's mustab. And if you pray bareheaded, it's makru. The reason that why people when they come back from the Gulf countries or when they come from Hajj, they normally, even in India, previously a few years back, maybe 10, 15 years back, the people when they prayed in the mosque, 99% or 99.9%, .9 whenever any man prayed in the mosque, he had his head covered, maybe 20 years back. But now we find that 25%, one fourth or one third of the people, they pray their salah bareheaded. The reason is that previously it was known that it is mustab to cover the head. So even when they didn't cover the head normally, at least while offering salah, they used to cover the head. Alhamdulillah. Even though they didn't cover the head normally, always, they covered the head at least while offering salah. It's a good sign. So when people go to Gulf countries, there they realize and they come to know that covering the head is not further for the salah to be accepted. And there are many people because they come from different parts of the world in the Gulf countries and they have different ways of practicing Islam. There is a hadith in which one of the sahabas, to show to the people that it's not fard, he just put one piece of cloth from the shoulder down below the knee and he prayed salah and it's accepted. So if you ask that is it fard to wear a cap or cover the head while offering salah, it's not a fard. But it is mustahab. So this is what they fail to realize that it is mustahab. So why should he not do it? So when they come back from the Gulf countries and they come to know it is not a fard, they try and show the people that we have knowledge and they purposely don't cover the head and now we find in the mosque about 25%, one third of them don't cover the head, which I feel is going away from the sunnah of the Prophet. These people, they fail to realize that if they ask the scholars of these Gulf countries, the top scholars, all of them, they cover the head. All of them, they cover the head. So just because it's like lack of knowledge is dangerous. Just because, fine, salah will be accepted, but it is mustahab. And according to Sheikh Nasr al-Albani, he says, that covering the head is mustahab and praying bareheaded is makro. And he says that the hadith of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, what he narrates about Prophet Muhammad that he kept his cap 
as a sutra in front of him while offering salah, it's a daif hadith. It's not authentic. And some of the scholars, especially from Egypt, they have given the fatwa that, you know, because in Ahram, when you're performing Hajj or doing Umrah, you don't cover your head and the Salah is accepted, therefore covering the head is not the criteria for offering Salah. If you read the Hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, never did the Prophet left his head uncovered while praying, except in Ahram, except while performing Hajj or Umrah, where the Prophet didn't cover his head. All other times, he had his head covered. The reason that during Umrah, while in Ahram, the head wasn't covered is because it is haram to cover the head. Many things which are mustab are haram during the state of ahram. If you say that because in hajj you don't cover the head, that it's a rule that you should not cover the head in salah, it's totally wrong. There are many things which are mustab. For example, cutting the nails is mustab in the normal day to day life. But in ahram it is haram. Similarly, covering the head is mustab, but in ahram only it's haram. So giving this logic is totally wrong. In ahram, you don't have to cover that because it's not allowed. It's violating the rules of ihram. But otherwise, you should cover the head. And if people are at least covering while offering salah, they should continue. They will get sawab. And that's what all the four aimas said. Even Sheikh Nasir al-Bani, Ibn Taymiyyah, Sheikh bin Baz, and all the scholars. And Imam Malik said that from the time of Islam till today, always the scholars and the sahabas and the salafists all in, they covered the head and they wore a turban. You know, whether they were a Tobin or a Kufi, etc. So I encourage that the Muslim should cover that. It's one of the recommended acts of the Prophet. So can you give us any logical reasons why we should um, cover the head and grow the beard? As far as covering the head is concerned, growing the beard, as I said, growing the beard is commandment of the Prophet, so we have to do it. Covering the head is sunnah of the Prophet, you do it. That's of the main reason. But if people want logical reason why they should do it, there is a saying that if the label shows your intent, wear it. And I've given a talk on this complete topic for with the question answered more than three hours, which I don't intend doing now. I'll just say in a nutshell. The saying that if the label shows your intent, wear it. Like if you go to a conference, you know, everyone wears the label, they wear the name, Dr. So and so, Dr. It's an informal introduction. If you go to a conference with a specialist of doctor, then it may say you're a cardiologist or a neurologist or a nephrologist, you know, so it gives an informal introduction. So similarly, wearing a cap or covering the head and sporting a beard is an informal introduction that you're a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 54, جَاءَ قَلَّزِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِينَ فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ that when you meet those people who believe in our signs, then say, Assalamu alaikum, peace be on you. So how will I recognize when I walk in the streets, especially in India and other countries, and I go to the Western countries, that he's a Muslim. So this is a good sign of being a Muslim. You know, we don't require another label. The label which the Prophet has given us the best, that covering your head and sporting a beard. And it does wonders. I'll give an example that once in Bombay, there was a young lad who was selling fruits. His name was Sultan. An elderly Muslim who was a very pious Muslim, he used to offer five times salah, used to give zakat, used to fast in the month of Ramadan, had gone fudge. He comes to buy fruit from this hawker. And he tells to this young boy, Sultan, why didn't you wish me salams? So he said, Uncle, I thought you were a Hindu. Imagine a Muslim calling this elderly man a mushrik. It's the biggest abuse you can give to this person. This person was a very pious person, but didn't have a beard, didn't cover his head. Who's to blame? Is the elderly gentleman to blame or the young lad for calling him a mushrik? Who's to blame? But naturally, the elderly gentleman, he could not recognize him. Therefore, if the label shows your intent, you should wear it. And you can give several such examples. For example, it has various benefits. If you're traveling in a bus or traveling in a train, and if there is a Muslim sister who's doing hijab, there are times in a non-Muslim country where somebody may tease her. But if there are 10 Muslims who don't know each other, each of them wearing a cap, a kufi, or sporting a beard, and they're sitting in the bus, the non-Muslim will think 10 times before teasing the Muslim girl. Oh, if I tease Muslim girl, these 10 Muslims will pounce on me. Even those 10 Muslims may be very feeble, may be old, but yet, he gets scared. So that's the reason it is good that he should wear the label because it shows your intent. For example, if there's a doctor, he's proud to put the name doctor before his name because he's proud to be a doctor. 
In this car, there is a sign of a cross, a red cross indicating that he's a doctor. In the emergency, if you have any problem on the street, you stop the car. Similarly, if any human being has a problem and wants help, and if you see the Muslim who has a label, a cap and a beard, he will ask him for help. He'll guide him to the truth. And I remember my grandparents telling that in Bombay, when any people wanted to hire a cab, even the non-Muslims, they preferred hiring a cab whose taxi driver was sporting a beard and keeping a cab because they knew he would be honest. They preferred going to a shop whose shopkeeper was sporting a beard and wearing a cap. Unfortunately, nowadays, the whole label has changed. We find Muslims wearing cap just to boss around, you know. And unfortunately, the media, they portray anyone who has a beard and wears a cap, he's a terrorist. And I've given this reply in my talk. So keeping a beard and wearing a cap or covering the head is a very recommended sunnah and keeping a beard is fard, so Muslims should stick to it and should be proud to identify themselves as Muslims. Well, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir, we've come to the end of yet another show and I think we've covered lots and lots of different aspects of uh, the sunnah. We've defined the sunnah, what is the sunnah and why the Muslims should be doing certain sunnahs during this blessed month of Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters, I hope, inshallah, that you derived a lot of benefit from the show today. And we've been talking, of course, about Ramadan as being the month of self-improvement and Islam, particularly talking about the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We've defined it and we've given you some examples. So go ahead and implement those in your life, inshallah. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, please do join us at the same time tomorrow when we will be discussing the topic Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam, part four. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صوم وعتق وقنو فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورزق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوبة